Hello Space Cats and welcome back to my channel. This week we're at a very special location. This is the XMM uh, control room and it's XMM Newton's 20th anniversary. I've got two very special guests here today and they're going to be telling us a little bit about XMM. So let's start off, tell us who you are and what you do. Hello, my name is Maria Santos Dio. I work in XMM Newton uh, Science Operations Center. I Science Operations Manager. Hello, my name is Norbert Schattel. I work as project scientist for XMM Newton, also here in Wiesbaden, near Madrid. Okay, um, what kind of qualifications do you need to get the job that you have? Well, when you need a PhD, a, a doctorate in astrophysics, and to get that, uh, well, you have to get a degree in physics or mathematics. Can you guys tell me what a typical day is like in your job? What do you do? Well, when I arrive, I come here to see how it was, the XMM activities, how it were during the night, if everything is going fine, if we are getting the data as you, we expect and, and the observations, planning for the next day or the next week's activities. Very different. <laughs> Very different seasons in the year. In the moment we have the time allocation teams running. This means in whole Europe we have different panels meetings and people for example contact me and have a question and want to have a quick answer. Most of the day emails, answers, Okay, so now let's jump straight into the bit that we're most interested in about. Um, what is XMM Newton? So you can both uh, <laughs> jump in. <laughs> so XMM Newton is a space observatory. Uh, so it's a spacecraft that is uh, flying above uh, the Earth, giving a complete uh, orbit every two days, and it has three extra telescopes. That means he has three telescopes that look at the universe uh, in X-rays. It also has one optical telescope that gets optical or ultraviolet images of the same objects that we are looking at in X-rays. We have behind the telescopes different types of instruments. We have behind two a reflection grating. This means it is a dispersion and dispersed spectra, similar like in a rainbow. You see the normal light, and in the rainbow you see the different colors. And basically we have this, but for the X-rays. And then we have three cameras behind, which have also resolution in energy, but less than the reflection gratings and in addition the optical monitor as Maria told already. So why is an X-ray telescope important? Why can't we just do everything that we do with just standard optical telescopes? Because all the really interesting mm -hmm. things are bright in X-rays and you see not much in the optical for example. So what are those interesting things? Black holes. Black holes. Black holes and the matter completely near to the event horizon almost with the speed of light goes around and emits in X-rays. Our clusters of galaxies, the deep potential of the dark matter, the gas falls in and is hot in X-rays. Okay, and you can't see this in optical, right? In optical you see only some enhancement of galaxies, very difficult to detect and in X-ray bright galaxy clusters. Perhaps the other other objects that we can see very well in X-rays is the remnants of uh, stars that exploded as supernova, and and then, then they spell out a lot of material at very 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 high velocities, and that shocks with the interstellar matter and heats up to very very hot temperatures, uh, millions of degrees, and then it shines in X-rays. So we know NASA have an X-ray telescope, Chandra. Is that one not enough? Why do we need XMM as well? How do the two compare to each other? So you are very close partners and have basically diff completely different features. It's basically like, say, a um, man and female. Okay. <laughs> Chandra 
has a much, much better spatial resolution, but a smaller fleet of view and a lower collecting area. And XMM has a wider field and a higher area, for so this a lower spatial resolution. And most targets we observe with both. We sometimes observe first with uh, XMM Newton and then with Chandra. With Chandra you can uh, find out if something that is seen as one single source is indeed one or more than one. And with XMM Newton what you can see is finer details that you cannot uh, see with uh, Chandra alone because it has lower sensitivity. So one is very good at distinguishing two different objects. If they are very is, close. Yeah, if they're very close. And one is very good at seeing what those objects actually are. Okay, so XMM Newton first launched in 1999. That was a very long time ago. And originally it was supposed to live only for six years. Is that ten, right? Ten, ten years. years. It was designed for ten years. It was designed for ten years. But now it's 20 years later. It's like doubled its life expectancy. You have to continuously adapt. Adapt to changes everywhere. Changes in the instrument that on space they, they get old. They, they, they change a little bit their performance. So you adapt your way of doing the pictures with them. You have to monitor and react fast. So you need a, a team of experienced people who know how the instrument work and, and who know how to react to something that not really expected to happen. And then you have to adapt also to science. Science is evolving and, and the astronomers are also evolving. So in order to, to get the funding agencies giving us money to, to have these teams that need to, to operate the, the, the spacecraft and the instruments, you need that the astronomers keep their interest in the XMM Newton data and the, the, the research. So for this you have to adapt to new discoveries that have been happening in astronomy in the last 20 years. Uh, perhaps we don't realize in our day-to-day -day work, but many things have, have happened and XMM Newton has always reacted to them. There were gravitational waves and XMM Newton observed gravitational waves. We have, we know now a lot of exo, extrasolar planets and we are also observing extrasolar planets. Cosmology is also evolving, dark matter, dark energy, and we are trying to... Uh, keep up with the science. Yes, keep with the science. Anything to add on that? Yes. <laughs> um, many people here were working in the IWE, this is International Ultraviolet Explorer. And this mission was one of the longest lasting scientific missions with 18 years. But this means we had the experience to run a mission much, much longer than expected. We should also mention an important point was we changed the operational mode, which reduced the consumption of fuel. For the first 10 years we were expected we can only go up to 20 years, simply because of fuel we need. But this was no change and with this we can run much longer. So how much longer do you expect XMM Newton to live for? At a minimum 10 years. In the minimum another 10 years, so 30 yes. years. Yes. So we should be back here in 10 years time yes, to celebrate definitely. the 30th. Um, and what's the biggest challenge for you for XMM so far? I think for the biggest challenge for XMM was when we lost contact. At some point we could not reach, also we sent commands and the spacecraft was not answering. So when was this? Um, since 10 years ago. Eight, 10 years ago. 2008. 2008. November 2008. And then you don't know at all what's going on. Right. And so How did it make you feel? Astro. Oh, very bad. <laughs> bad? It, bad? It was really, uh, we really feared that we had lost and the mission was over. And yes. then astronomers looked, looked even with the optical telescopes if there are several pieces around. Wow. And fortunately this was not the case. It was only one. It was only one. <laughs> Thank goodness. And it was an error in switching from one antenna to the other. Okay. And the switch was sticking, stuck between oh, no. the two things. 
unfortunately, NASA was helping us with very, very powerful antennas. Yeah. They sent basically the command at the end, which was so powerful that it was coming through the half-closed switch to put wow. it back. And then XMM was back and happily we continued. So that sounds like a huge challenge. Yeah. Were there like panic protocols in place for something to happen like this? I guess this isn't something that you would expect would have happened. I think such things you need simply experience and stay cool. When one spacecraft has traveled, this spacecraft can declare emergency. Yeah. And then everybody in the world uh, helps if they can. So when XMM is closer to the Earth, it's on top of North America. Okay. And NASA has a big antenna in Goldstone. And this, this was the best antenna for us to use to send a telecommand and that the spacecraft reacted because it's very big and the spacecraft is closer. So right. it's, it's the highest distance. So we declare emergency and all the space agencies help if a spacecraft is under emergency. So I think this is very nice protocol. Okay. Yeah, that sounds really nice. Mm -hmm. Enough with the sad news. What do you think XMM's greatest achievement so far has been? Yes, zero six nine. It's only last year. We yeah. put a lot of disciplinary time in. It's a unique source. We never saw something before. You have this active galactic nuclear, where this black hole in the center of the galaxy is much, much brighter than the root galaxies. And this object, basically every nine hours, becomes a factor 80 brighter, the 100 brighter than it was wow. before, for one hour and goes back. And it repeats. We have never seen such a repeating signal from such an AGN, also from this supermassive black hole. And I think it is basically, this is a reality, two black holes, a more massive in the center, then a smaller one going around, the big one has an accretion disk, and every nine hours roughly the small one goes through the accretion disk, gets matter and um, flares. Nice. But this interpretation is not final, but for me this is the most <laughs> attracting explanation. Well, this one is very, very nice, of course, because uh, we have been studying active galactic nuclei for years. We know they vary, but it's the first one we see really something regular that uh, every nine hours for a duration of one hour. Apart from that, perhaps um, the discoveries related to cosmology and how the universe evolved and, and, and uh, the universe content that matter and that energy because XMM is helping to understand the nature of this dark matter by observing clusters of galaxies and very recently there are some people that claim that also observing distant quasars we they they have discover a relationship between their luminosity and x-rays and optical that they can use to infer the distance of these quasars, how far they are. And this is very important because then they can uh, use it to, to study how the universe has been expanding since the Big Bang. And their first results tend to suggest that there is a difference in this expansion at the early times of the universe compared to what we see is happening now. So these are recent results and they are planning to confirm these results with new observations. But if this is really confirmed, this will be a kind of revolutionary for, for cosmology. Right, it will be game changing, right? I guess yeah. if the expansion rate rate is changing, yes. then yes. it doesn't follow the standard theories that we've been looking at so far. So X-Man's been running a long time, do you think now it's reached its peak science or is there more things to come? I know you mentioned gravitational waves, but what else do we have for science? 
Well, Norway has many, many examples, <laughs> but uh, I am sure it has not reached the peak because uh, I mentioned before, astronomy science has been evolving and XML Newton has always been there. So there, there are gravitational waves and, and XML Newton will observe and uh, there is, we call it multi-messenger because it's not only electro electromagnetic radiation that is now telling, so light that is now telling us about the universe. It's also the gravitational waves, the sound, and it's also neutrinos. Very recently, the source of neutrinos, cosmic neutrinos, was identified for the first time. And this source was identified to be a blazer that is a kind of active galactic nucleus that is pointing, has a jet pointing towards us. And we see these blazers also in X-rays. So we will for sure observe more X-rays from blazers associated with neutrinos. We will observe uh, sources of gravitational waves. We will continue observing exoplanets to, to see how the X-ray radiation from the star, the host star, impacts on the possibility for the planet to have an atmosphere and to have, therefore, light. If you look to the publications, then the number of publications using XML Newton data, it rise and then it's extremely constant. Okay. I would say it's constant for the last 15 years. This total number simply reflects the time we need for a typically one source. And if, and if a mission can observe a new source in five seconds, then you get much more payments. Therefore, the constant number basically is explainable, but normally missions go up and go down. And this is not the case for NASA. If you look to nature and science papers, it was very low for the first 10 years, and now it's going up. And already now we have the second highest number in this year, and if we get a paper more, it's the highest number. And the astronomy in the moment, from the observa observational um, perspective, established a lot of wide field surveys. Mm -hmm. As this is tricky experiment, I think they look to a quarter of the, of the sky every night. We have the test which looks to the whole sky to look for exoplanets. We have the Erosita which surveys the whole sky. But all these surveys bring new sources, detect rare new source classes, and this is a fantastic area to follow up. And therefore, in principle, I think the XMM is even more needed than in the past to get their new results out. So you're saying XMM is going to be really important for follow-up observations for the big surveys? Yes. An example is Tidal Disruption Events. Tidal Disruption Events. Tidal Disruption Events. Yeah. Most fantastic. A star comes and has this cataclysmic um, gravitational field acting on it and sweatering the scar and then making an equation, this equation to the black hole. Now before, they were randomly detected. When they explode and say half a year later, you found it then. Now these surveys, they look every second day, they find it in the optical. And now the people can start from this optical zero point and they see this X-ray behavior is partly completely different than behave. They are quiet and they go up in X-rays. And this is a complete new field where we need an enormous amount of observations. And now we detect, say, one per month. And maybe in three, four years, with all this mission running, we have one every three weeks. And then we already can start to look for the more rare events in these types. Therefore, I see it completely positive. The problem is not, um, the problem is the time we can observe. There we would need more. Right, so we should build more of these XMM yes. telescopes. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like there's so much more to look forward to with XMM in the coming future. There's still loads of science to be done in the X-ray domain. Um, we're looking forward to another 10 years of XMM. Um, yeah, and at hope, least. <laughs> also we hope to run up the moment the Athena is launched, yeah. which is the next large X-ray observatory from ESA, 
and if possible at all, we would like to shake the hands <laughs> and basically to use our calibration sources to, to cross, calibrate the to next calibrate generation. The next. This would then That's immediately right. give them a steep start. That would be brilliant. And we would be happy to see them as a first joint observation at the end. Wow. Thank you so much for letting me interview you. It's been great to chat. Very interesting. Pleasure. <laughs> Pleasure. Um, thank you all for watching. Um, I'll put some extra reading material down below of more information about Exman Newton if you're interested in finding out more. And as usual, if you liked the video, don't forget to leave me a like, share, and subscribe. <laughs>